And this is WNJC 1360 AM out of Washington Township, New Jersey, the Rob Call Bottom Up Radio Show. Tonight, my guest for this portion of the show is David Swanson. David, welcome to the show. Hey, Rob. Great to be here. Now, you've got a, a really good and excellent new book out called War is a Lie. And uh, I have to congratulate you. I checked and saw that it was in the top 40 books on Amazon overall. That's fabulous. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you, and thank you for the wonderful uh, review you wrote of it uh, and for helping with your email list and website. Uh, you know, it takes, a, it takes some effort when you don't own a television network like Glenn Beck or have the rights to be on all of them like George Bush to, to get your book up there. But then once it's up there, people see it, and uh, apparently they're continuing to buy it thanks to all the great uh, reviews that have been coming in, uh, especially yours. Yeah. Well, it was it was easy to to write it. <laughs> um, I, I should, uh, Rob. I should tell people about Amazon that uh, because this is a print-on-demand book, which is apparently too much for them to comprehend, uh, they're falsely telling people that you won't get the book until after Christmas and so forth, uh, which is absolutely not true. You can order the book at Amazon or anywhere else, and it will be uh, printed and shipped uh, right away. Okay. Um, you start off the book by saying, quote, a war based on lies, quote, is just a long-winded way of saying a war. The lies are part of the standard package. And That's right. Basically, you take this book and go through all the different ways that war is a lie. And uh, uh, it's, it's just an outstanding standing job of, of, of really just showing all the ways that the, the, the dishonesty and the fraud that goes into war is a lie. How did you get started with this? How did you get to, into writing this book? Well, you know, I, I was involved, as many of us were, in trying to expose and get some action following the exposure of war, of lies about the Iraq War. Uh, and yet I was annoyed and aggravated the more I looked at past wars and the more I heard from very informed and intelligent people otherwise uh, who would tell me that the war on Iraq was somehow unique, uh, that you know this was unprecedented to have a war based on lies, to have a president tell lies to the Congress and the public to start a war, absolutely unheard of. Uh, and the closer you look at every past war, whether it's a U.S. war or, or a war launched by another nation, uh, they are all based on lies. That is, lies are told to get them going. Lies are told to escalate them. Lies are told to prolong them. Lies are told after the fact to justify them in the history books that had nothing to do with what happened at the time. Lies are told to keep the machinery of war in place and the preparations for war and the war powers to allow more wars to, to come along. Uh, it's all dishonest. Uh, and so people like to find some war in the past that they think was a good or a just war and point to that one and say, ha-ha, wars can be good, and therefore even this war is somehow good, even though this one is based on lies. The other one wasn't. You know, and, and you know, it's a crazy argument to begin with, but it doesn't have any basis in fact, because you can't find a good war anywhere. Uh, they're all based on lies. And I I think that's what's so powerful about this. I, I, I took a moment to dig up my review because I want to I want to put this into this interview. I'm going to read the review that I put on Amazon. Uh, I, it's titled "Important: Destined to Be a Classic." Activist David Swanson is a well respected is well respected in the anti-war community as a man who walks his talk in a bold, committed, solid way. That he is a principled leader. Now we must add to that list of credentials authorship of an important destined to be classic book. War is a Lie addresses the web of lies, the taboo subjects, the false claims, the mythic messages that are hollow and empty, and it lays waste to them. Swanson's book is a, and I've never used the term to describe a book before, poor de force, an intellectual accomplishment that, accomplishment that lays out the truths about war and the lies that support it in a way 
that every peace activist, every anti-war organization and group must digest and frankly use as the tools to take the arguments against war to a new and more effective level. If there are awards for brilliant books that explode new ways to oppose the evils of this world, then David should sweep the field this year. And I really thought, David, that you know this, this book could get you a Nobel Peace Prize. It's really incredible. One more thing, it's an, an exceptional accomplishment to present a book with such important ideas. It is another thing to write extraordinarily well. So on page after page, the words are quotable rising off the page with vivacity. You've done an incredible job here, and, and it's an easy read, and it's powerful and moving and convincing, and, and they're loaded with ammunition so that people who read this can start talking to the liars who are selling war, basically. You know, I, I, I have to say, um, you know, I, I have a friend uh, who... Uh, is uh, doing some work. He, he, he has this theory that the nuclear bomb is not a deterrent. Have you heard this? Well, I don't think it uh, is a deterrent in most of the ways people think it is, but I, I don't know what you're referring to. Well, um, I can't but, but let me just say, Rob, I've never had such a great book review of a book I've written uh, or even read such a great review of anybody else's book ever. Um, I, 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 I sincerely appreciate it, and I, and I hope the book lives up to it for people. But, you know, the one bit that, of course, is very much in doubt is that it becomes a classic. You know, people have to hear about it for that to happen. Uh, and I don't have a major publishing house paying the bookstores to put it on the front table and paying Amazon to put, uh, put ads for it at the top of their site and so forth. All of that stuff is paid for with money, uh, and I don't have it. So if people don't buy it and call the media and put it in their libraries and and pass it out uh, and and spread it around on their websites and email lists, uh, nobody will hear about it uh, except for a little corner of the population that that already tends to care. Uh, and, and so, you know, it may be a classic in, in the minds of some people. Uh, I don't know if it's my place to, to even, uh, you know, suggest that, but uh, it, it, won't be a, it won't be a classic unless uh, everybody miraculously somehow knows it exists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got to get the word out about this, well, which is why um, one of the reasons I'm doing this interview, I guess the reason I was asking you about, uh, his name is Ward Wilson, uh, and he, he talks about nuclear de the myth of nuclear deterrence. Ward started out writing a couple articles about this, and he's now got mid-six-figure funding from the Nobel Foundation to support his work. And I would love to see the same thing happen for you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll connect you with him because I think you'd enjoy, and you'd both enjoy meeting each other. Uh, but, well, uh, th that kind of that kind of money, if it could go into the peace movement, whether through me or anyone else, uh, would change this country. Uh, you know, we, we just have never had serious funding uh, of a push for for peace. Uh, you, you have it on the other side uh, in spades, but it would it would make a, a world of difference. Uh, I mean, we have it dumped into political campaigns uh, from people who want peace and pick the candidates who are a little bit less war hungry than the others, you know, but uh, that doesn't seem to work. Yes. Well, uh, we this book is a good beginning. This book uh, is ammunition. Uh, I don't know how many people. Do you have any idea how many how many peace uh, activists there are? How many peace groups there are in this country? Wow. I mean, it yeah. depends how you def define them. I, I mean, there are groups that have small chapters all over the place, including United for Peace and Justice and American Friends Service Committee and uh, PDA and Peace Action and. Uh, Code Pink, and you know there are thousands and thousands uh, of peace groups. Most of them uh, completely volunteer. Uh, none of them funded in the way that these corporate front groups that create things like the Tea Party are funded. None of them, uh, absolutely unheard of. But I mean, you think there are ten thousand anti-war people or peace activists, 100,000, a million. I mean, 
millions well, showed up against the war. I mean, I, I just wonder. I mean, I mean, come on, David, this is part of your due diligence in doing your marketing research for this book. Are you just doing this as an intellectual endeavor? <laughs> Well, I don't want I don't want to win over peace activists to the cause of peace so much as I want to win over everybody else. Uh, but uh, peace activists are the ones who are going to help me spread the word and invite me to events and give the book out in front of recruiting stations and so forth. And uh, there are certainly millions and millions of people who have been active for peace in one way or another. Have have gone to marches, have called their congressmen, have attended events, uh, have protested and gone to jail. I mean, there are uh, millions and millions. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how to define it or how to get you a, a, an accurate number down to the last peace activist, uh, but uh, there, there's not a shortage. And, and if you look at, you know, peace Peace supporters, short of any sort of activism, people who would tell pollsters that they support peace, that they want these wars to end, uh, for example, you know, we have a majority of the country. When, when good surveys are done on where people want money in our government, a strong majority wants to take a lot of money out of the military and put it into peaceful areas. A uh, majority of, of our country at this point says it was a mistake to go into Afghanistan, it was a mistake to go into Iraq. Now, it would have been nice if a majority of Americans had said that and shouted it at the time when it would, it would have done more good when we were going into those countries uh, because it's so much harder to get out than it is to get in. Uh, but you know, now we've got that, that support. But then are those people who, who oppose just these particular wars and they'll cheer for the next war for five years, ten years, and then turn against it? Or are they people who have come to an understanding that there's something wrong with all of the wars, uh, something wrong financially perhaps, understanding that our economy can't stand it anymore, something wrong legally, understanding that these are crimes, something wrong environmentally, understanding that our environment can't survive these wars, or, or, or even something wrong uh, in moral terms, that, that it is simply evil to be behaving this way, uh, it, it's very hard to know. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it certainly can't hurt to deepen people's understanding uh, of what's wrong with these wars and how it's typical of what's wrong with, with all of these wars and, and to give the peace activists the tools to, to make their arguments uh, with historical data against those who are arguing the other side. Now, you, you, you say in your introduction something that I think really kind of nails this. So the, the, this book is, I'm reading here, the, this book is aimed at exposing the falsehood of all the more and less coherent rationales that have been offered for wars. And this is the killer. If this book succeeds in its intent, the next time a war is proposed, there will be no need to wait to see whether the justifications turn out to be false. We will know that they are false. We will know that even if true, they will not serve as justifications. And I think this is it. Somebody brings a war to the table, a president says we need to go to war. The answer is this is based on lies. This war is, the claims for the reason for this war is based on lies. And we've seen it over and over again. Retrospectively, that's always the case, and that's what your book again and again proves, even in the war that has gone down in American history as, quote, the good war. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, when, when you have these discussions about the war on Iraq, the question is always, well, did they really have weapons, or did people honestly, if mistakenly, believe they had weapons? And it's never asked does does a, a country possessing possessing weapons justify launching a war against them uh, and of course it doesn't unless you've combined it with demonization of that country or its ruler uh, to the point where people think that these are barbarians who who if they have weapons will immediately lash out and use them even suicidally uh, it can't be tolerated for an instant uh, and when we go when we talk about the war on Afghanistan uh, we talk about whether or not Afghanistan was at all responsible for 9-11 uh, and we never step back and ask, well, does fighting wars for revenge make any sense?
when we had the choice of prosecuting, uh, get, getting the, the criminals responsible put on trial, and we chose a war on a, on a nation of people instead, a nation where 92% of them in a poll this week uh, couldn't identify what 9-11 was. Uh, does that make any any sense? Certainly it doesn't legally. Revenge has never been put forward as a legal justification for a war. Uh, and then, as you say, people will point out, well, there was a just war. It was World War II. Uh, and that proves that war is a good idea, even if maybe we did these recent ones a little bit wrong, uh, which is absolutely crazy and ahistorical. You know, a lot of it is based on this idea that that Hitler was so evil and the Nazis were so evil and they killed the Jews. Uh, and of course, the war had nothing to do with that. Uh, and Churchill and Roosevelt were very uh, consciously making sure the war had nothing to do with saving the Jews and that no Jews were being saved. Uh, and we wouldn't let them into this country. Roosevelt would not permit uh, a single additional immigrant into the country uh, and saw to it that a bill to allow uh, Jewish refugee children into the country, into homes that were waiting for them, uh, would not pass the Congress. Uh, and people will say, oh, okay, well, uh, at least uh, we were fighting someone evil, even if we weren't uh, helping out in every way to mitigate the, the evil deeds. Well, you know, we also had to be lied into that war. Uh, and Roosevelt uh, and Churchill uh, were, were very intent on provoking Japan to attack uh, in order to then pretend that we were fighting a defensive war in Europe as well, even though it was Japan that had attacked. And, and so we imposed horrible sanctions on Japan. We were destroying its economy. We were participating in a war against Japan uh, on behalf of China, uh, semi-secretly. I mean, it was in the newspapers. It, it, we were careful to make sure the Japanese government knew about it. And we were building military bases and airstrips all around the Pacific. Uh, which Japan was warning us well, they, they viewed as a threat. Uh, we were planning an aggressive war on Japan, and we were just waiting to get them to start it. Uh, and Roosevelt was lying about the Nazis and, and you know, sinking, sinking ships with their submarines when the ships were helping British planes attack the submarines and, and so forth. I mean, just endless lies uh, and a draft already underway. Uh, and people say, oh, well, Roosevelt didn't want a war. Of course he didn't want a war uh, when it was everything he wanted and the media knew it was everything he wanted and, and it was a very poorly kept secret. Uh, and, and people say, well, maybe... Maybe the U.S. population, such ignorant plebeians, had to be lied into a war, but it was still a good war. They just had to be lied into it for their own good. Well, I mean, that is to destroy the idea of government of the people, uh, and it is to miss the evidence that, that nothing uh, imaginable could be worse than wars, in particular that war, the very worst war, 70 million people dead. So even the best war was based on a lie. Even the war that is touted as the one that was justified and good. And you have a chapter on noble wars. Uh, talk about that. Well, I, I, I have uh, one chapter. Let me see. It's uh, chapter six called War Makers Do Not Have Noble Motives, uh, maybe what yeah. you're referring to. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that's it's sort of my effort. I, I, I don't in this book, I, I should tell people I don't take it war by war, which would be sort of an endless encyclopedia of, of similar redundant repetitive lies. But I but I take themes. I, I take the idea that wars are fought against evil or that wars are fought in defense. And I and I provide evidence through the centuries that those those categories of war lies are, are false every time. Uh, and so I, I then take up in, in chapter six uh, the quest, the inevitable question, well, then what are wars fought for? Uh, because people always want to know when they discover that some uh, some lie was a lie. Well, then what was the truth? Uh, and people look for maybe one reason why they wanted war. And it's never one reason. It's always a, a combination of reasons. And they're never very secret. Uh, you know, wars are fought for power, for domination of the globe, to weaken and, and prevent rival superpowers. They're, they're fought for territory. They're fought for... Uh, possessions, they're fought for resources, uh, above all oil in, in recent wars. Uh, they're fought for profit, they're fought 
for the gain of the of the weapons makers and the reconstructors of the destroyed territory, uh, and they're fought for for electoral advantage by politicians who think they must have wars to be great presidents, they must support wars to be to, to win elections and so forth. There's a there's a whole array of reasons. But what's interesting is that the reasons discussed in in private. Uh, tend to tend to to lean toward those types of reasons economic reasons and 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 profit reasons whereas the reasons put forth in public endlessly repeatedly saturation coverage uh tend to be the things not talked about in private at all you know things like uh things like spreading democracy or fighting evil dictators uh who've been demonized or supporting the troops by continuing the war the troops are fighting in and so forth uh you know it, it, everything comes out in public it's just that some things are are mentioned once on page 18 and some things are on your television night and day in an endless loop uh and so you have think tanks like the project for the new american century laying out publicly the reasons that they want wars it's it's not secret uh but then you have the, these fabricated nonsense reasons uh about evil dictators who must be stopped put on people's televisions and front pages over and over again um and that's that's the problem uh you know that it's to the point where you can find records of meetings uh by war planners and i and i have a, an example of this from the vietnam war uh war planners in washington sitting down together decided on more war they want to escalate the war in vietnam and together they want to devise a reason why not a reason for the public but a reason for themselves to believe why they should have more war and then as a complete second stage come up with reasons to tell the public uh, and so even the even these reasons of of, of profit and and power struggles uh, don't fully explain why these wars happen. Uh, you know, these are wars that, in many cases, as in the current war in Afghanistan, everybody knows it's hopeless and pointless, and it's just a question of when we pull out, how much blood and treasure we lose first, and yet they can't help themselves. Uh, and so I spend a, a good chunk of that chapter looking at the that the history and the prehistory of war and what the and what the irrational drives seem to be that make wars happen uh when there is no explanation possible are there lobbyists for war oh <laughs> of course there are i'm uh, uh, i i've I'm planning on, on, on writing something about a recent uh, meeting in Washington uh, uh, at the National Press Club pushing for a new war on Iran. Uh, there are there are well-funded groups advocating for a war on Iran as we speak, uh, which is an example of, of the American public successfully doing what you mentioned uh, reading from my introduction, uh, that is refusing to be lied to. We've refused to be lied to about Iran for several years now, uh, I think in large part because the lies are so similar to the ones about Iraq and they're still so fresh. Um, but there are there are American organizations and foreign organizations uh, that push for these wars. We, we had Kuwait hire, uh, the nation of Kuwait hire a, a major public relations firm in Washington to spread lies about uh, Iraqis uh, taking babies out of incubators and leaving them on the cold floor of the hospital and so forth. And uh, we had uh, I I Iraq... Iraqi and Israeli uh, groups uh, funneling bogus information uh, into Washington to, to get a war on Iraq. Um, and then, of course, you have the whole war industry, the weapons industry. The, the United States is far and away the biggest exporter of weapons. Many, uh, many wars that we aren't even part of are fought with our weapons, and many wars that, that we are part of are fought on both sides with our weapons. We're, we're fighting... Uh, wars against militaries armed by our companies. Uh, and then we have the biggest military itself uh, in the world, far and away, you know, bigger than numbers 2 through 15 combined. Uh, and that's supplied by companies that very carefully manufacture the same weapon in dozens of congressional districts, a little piece here, a little piece there, uh, in order to, to put pressure on Congress members who don't want to be seen as, as losing jobs 
for their constituents. Uh, and then the whole public relations industry uh, that is, you know, semi-private and semi-public and and, and uh, largely illegal. Uh, and we we have former generals secretly paid by the Pentagon to to pretend that their own opinions are the talking points they've been fed by the military. We have phony news produced uh, by the government and put out as if it's independent news stories. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of industries, including the, the so-called mainstream corporate media itself, that, that benefit from wars, that profit from wars. And, and yet the economy as a whole is being destroyed by this military machine, uh, which is the least efficient use of public dollars there is, even worse than tax cuts, uh, when you want to create jobs and, and stimulate the economy. Uh, we, well, we speaking, of, speaking of the media, I need to do a station ID. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Radio Show, WNJC 1360 AM, sponsored by opednews.com. Uh, where David Swanson, who was my guest tonight, is a regular contributor. Uh, now, we're interviewing, I'm interviewing David about his new book, War is a Lie, which is really a must-read. It's, it's an incredibly important book that uh, you really got to take a look at. Uh, you can find out about it at warisalie.org. That's the website for the book, or davidswanson.org if you want to find out more about David Swanson. The book hit number 39 on Amazon uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, yeah, 30, 38 I saw it at for a while. Uh, and number one, yeah, 38 in all books and number one in public policy, number one in war and peace and, and so forth. Uh, so a, a lot of people are buying it. Yeah, well, that's, it's, and well they should. It's, it's an important book and, and like I said earlier, this is this book should get you a, a look at from the Nobel uh, Peace Committee. You've got well, you can there. you can nominate me, Robin. I'll appreciate it, but uh, I'll have mixed emotions. Uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was not good enough for these people, but yeah, and you know, Obama Kissinger was, was <laughs> Barack Obama was. You know, well, uh, well, let's not criticize them because who knows? Maybe they'll fund you. You know, they do funding for people too, and uh, you deserve it. It's, this book hopefully will open some doors for you and open some eyes for a lot of people. Uh, well, there are a lot. There are a lot of more deserving people out there than Barack Obama to get a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and if they won't give it to one of them, I, I hope they'll give it to George W. Bush and and arrest him at the airport. That, I think that would that would redeem them in the world's eyes. Let's talk a little bit more about this book. Uh, you know, you've got a chapter in here, uh, chapter five. Warriors are not heroes. Well, you know, one of the biggest, most powerful myths that gets the, these wars going and keeps them going is the idea that anybody who fights in a war, at least for the United States of America, is a hero. Uh, and of course, to be a hero, you have, you have to be brave and courageous actually for some good cause, uh, not for crimes, not for mass murder, not for, for, for stupid, pointless actions, but for a good and noble cause. Uh, it's not enough just to jump out a window, you know, that's bravery, and, and our wars are full of bravery, um, but it's bravery, and it's it's the best of, of human character put to the worst ends, uh, and and people somehow fail to to see through that. I, uh, I think I mentioned in that in that chapter uh, the the incident that cost Bill Maher his his job as a television host. He later got got another one, um, but he said he he agreed with a guest who had made the comment that people flying airplanes into buildings is not cowardly. Uh, you know, he didn't say it was good. He didn't say it wasn't evil and murderous and criminal and disgusting. All he said was it wasn't cowardly. As of course it wasn't. It was it was infinitely brave. Uh, it was just bravery for a, a horrible end. Uh, and I think that that's what's happened is that Americans have come to, to think that bravery by itself, for whatever purpose, is a good thing. Uh, and since killing people in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon was a bad thing, it couldn't possibly be brave. Uh, and yet, of course, it was. We, it was, it was it, 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 the, the epitome of bravery. We just have to understand that bravery by itself uh, is a horrible, horrible thing, and bravery with blind obedience or delusional beliefs uh, or, or hateful beliefs uh, is a horrible, horrible thing. 
Um, and, and yet, if we if we can't understand that, if we can't get to the point as as President Kennedy said in, in a letter to a friend, he would never have said such a thing in public. Uh, it, you know, if we can't get to the point where conscientious objectors have the prestige and the respect that soldiers have, we will keep having wars. Uh, and I, I pick this up in a later chapter uh, called something like "Wars Are Not Prolonged for the Good of the Soldiers." Uh, you know, this is overwhelmingly the case that Congress members make for funding wars. Uh, they have to fund them for the benefit of the soldiers fighting in them, even though they are such horrible things, whether justified or not, for the soldiers who who are so traumatized when they are not uh, physically destroyed or or killed uh, in these wars. Uh, we we prolong the wars to support the troops, as the phrase goes. Uh, and we have to we have to get beyond that understanding to to see wars as as crimes that we prolong if we want to continue committing a crime and we end if we want to cease committing a crime and the most good we can do for the soldiers is to stop giving them illegal orders and stop abusing them. Uh, that's going to take breaking some of these myths. What are the most uh, difficult myths that this challenges? Huh. Well. You know, the, there, there's sort of a, a, a pair of strong arguments for most of our wars that are completely contradictory between the two, but that reach different groups of people. So, so you have this argument that wars are, are fought in defense. Even preemptively, we have to go to attack a, an impoverished nation halfway around the globe in defense so that they can't someday possibly dream of attacking us. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the case that's, that's made endlessly now that wars are, are humanitarian, that wars are acts of generosity. We're benefiting these people. We're, we're staying in Iraq and Afghanistan for the benefit of the Iraqis and the Afghans, whether they like it or not. They're too, they're, they're too uh, inferior to us to understand our wisdom, but, but it's for their good. And, and so you have, a, you have a huge section of the American public that supports wars on that idea, you know, as, as George W. Bush said so many times, we can't abandon the Iraqi people. At the same time that you have other Americans, a huge chunk of the population, backing the very same wars uh, because they want all Muslims and Arabs and Iraqis, you know, wiped off the face of the earth as, as evil vermin, you know. And, uh, and, and of course, both arguments are, are crazy and, and baseless. Um, but you have these... You, you have these myths built up uh, around both of them uh, that reach different groups of people who block out the other information that they don't want to see and buy into that myth. Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the desire that drives all of that uh, is in large part the desire to believe your government does good things. Uh, you know, this whole idea of the big lie, right? the, the big lie is, is that, you know, people like you and I who would be much more uh, willing to tell little fibs than to tell huge lies tend to think that their government it works the same way. And so if something would require a big lie, and in fact a big lie about a big crime, then we don't want to think that our elected leaders would do such a thing. Uh, and so it takes us years to decide that a war was a mistake, and we do it without even facing up to the fact that the people who started the war knew it was a crime and, and were lying about it to begin with. Uh, it, it's painful for some people to come to that realization. You talk about uh, security. You have a chapter on security, that war does not bring security, and it's not sustainable. Talk about that, because one of the big claims of war is that it makes us safer. Right. Well, you know, this global war on terrorism or terror has seen a global rise in terrorism or terror through the course of it, through the past several years, to the point where our government stopped putting out reports on uh, on incidents of, of terrorism around the globe each year because they kept going up, which didn't look good while we were fighting a war supposedly uh, against it. And of course we weren't. We were fighting wars for the sake of wars for all the reasons we mentioned earlier, and, and the excuse that's sort of pr 
uh, replaced the Soviet Union and the evil empire is the global force of al-Qaeda and terrorism, uh, which we see behind every bush now instead of seeing Stalin. And, uh, and yet, predictably, uh, the wars make us less safe. The, the terrorism is driven by blowback against our hateful policies to begin with, right? which is not to justify, is merely to explain uh, the, the, the mass murders of terrorists. Uh, they, they will tell you quite plainly that they object to us occupying their nations and their holy sites and, and, and kicking in their doors and uh, humiliating their family members and bombing their towns uh, and stationing our troops around the world. They, they object to all of that. They, they don't give a damn about our supposed freedoms that we tease ourselves they hate us for. Uh, and, and so – to to in, to escalate that policy, you know, even if we take the troops out of Saudi Arabia, we put them all in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and we start bombing every corner of Pakistan, and we have uh, special forces operating in 75 countries. Now we we push that, uh, you know, that's that's predictably going to make us less safe, and it has made us less safe. Uh, all of our airport security theater notwithstanding. Uh, and, and then if you look at uh, the question of environmental security, you know, the biggest destroyer of the environment, the biggest uh, U.S. consumer of petroleum, uh, you know, the greatest force for uh, immediate environmental destruction uh, is the U.S. military and our wars. Uh, our, our environment is not going to survive this course uh, of action of wars fought for oil uh, as themselves the single biggest consumer of oil. Uh, if you look at nuclear proliferation and the danger of a nation or a non-nation actor launching a nuclear catastrophe, we are engaged in policies that make that increasingly likely. And, and, and that's something that's going to, to develop exponentially to the point where it becomes a near certainty that we're going to all die uh, from nuclear catastrophe. Uh, and if you just look at, at the idea of sustaining and surviving this course uh, with, a, with a civil representative government in place that provides liberties and rights to people, uh, that is looking less and less viable. Uh, our rights are stripped away in a more and more permanent fashion uh, justified by the wars. Uh, and our economy as well is not going to survive these wars. So uh, I I any way you slice it, uh, we have no choice but to end this, this militarized uh, war economy and, and war a a as a tool of public policy. You, you talk in Chapter 8 about how wars are not fought on battlefields. It's everywhere, you say. Well, what I mean by... And it's nowhere. You say it's everywhere and it's nowhere. <laughs> Well, well, what I mean by that is, is you know, first of all, to address the term battlefield or battle space, as they sometimes use now, to, that, is, that shows up as often as troops and support the troops, uh, you know, fight on the battlefield. And, and, of course, there are no battlefields. There are no big open flat spaces like the Civil War or World War I in France with, with two pairs of armies in different uniforms lined up against each other as cannon fodder. Uh, we just don't have wars like that anymore. We have occupations. We have wars fought in people's towns and cities and villages. Uh, and, and so the, everything you can imagine in civilian life is right there on the supposed battlefield. Uh, and the, the supposed enemy and the supposed beneficiaries of the war uh, are there cohabiting, and they look exactly the same, and it's uh, difficult to decide who's who. Uh, the only people you can really pick out, uh, as the resistance so easily does, are, are the foreign occupiers, uh, the U.S. military. Uh, and so there is no battlefield uh, that looks like a field or that has a battle on it with, with two opposing armies. And yet, at the same time, the battle space, as the army calls it, is absolutely everywhere, uh, including in the United States, uh, where we have active military. We're part of Northern Command now. We have the military working with police and immigration. We have, we have the potential for the use of the military on our own soil, and we have 
Americans declared enemy combatants. Uh, we have a policy at, uh, claiming the legality uh, or, or perhaps the propriety and laws be damned of, uh, of assassinating Americans if they're abroad, but nobody really believes that if they were in this country, the same wouldn't apply. We have uh, people like John Yu explaining how drones can be used against Americans and American cities will be collateral damage. Uh, it, it, we have the power to simply declare you an enemy combatant uh, and your bedroom and your kitchen becomes part of the battlefield uh, and so it's everywhere in the in the the, the confirmation hearings of our newest uh, Supreme Court justice Elena Kagan we 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 saw her agree with a Republican senator who asked her repeatedly uh, and she finally agreed that the war is just has no limits uh, either temporally or spatially it is it is everywhere and without end Mm-hmm. And I don't think that uh, people, I don't think the media covers that. The, I, I think that that's something important that needs to be brought out. I mean, when people are protesting and getting arrested, I know you were you were, were on tel- television last night talking about what happened down at Fort Benning, the protests against the, uh, the school of the Americas. Americas yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this, these are symptoms of, of our war, our, our war culture. And well, yet, they're, they're, you know, you, know you, 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 you have another chapter, and you say wars are not won, and they're not ended by enlarging them. So you can't win a war. Well, that's right. Um, I, I mean, but just on the earlier point, quickly, that I, I think that when the new House Armed Services Committee chairman, the Congressman McKeon, pushes to to update, as he calls it, the military authorization to use uh, force, uh, the the uh, this bill that was passed in 2001 uh, that says the president can just start wars as he sees fit against nations involved with 9/11. If they update this to say any nation anywhere any time doesn't have to there doesn't have to be a pretense of a connection to 911 as of course there isn't in some of the wars we're engaged in now in in Pakistan and Yemen and so forth uh then you know we really are going to be formalizing you know a a a a a, a a law that that strips away the the constitutional powers of Congress to decide on wars uh, and hands it over to the president uh, and in, and includes perhaps stipulates explicitly uh, that the president can destroy civil rights and take away uh, the Bill of Rights uh, uh, when it's wartime, uh, as of course uh, the current president has been doing, justifying it on this uh, authorization to use military force. Uh, uh, And that may be uh, done with more strength. So my point is there may be an opportunity with a congressional debate over a crazy piece of legislation uh, to force into the public discussion uh, this problem of permanent, infinite, limitless war. Um, I think, you know, I really, you know, you got me thinking because really uh, when Obama loses to Palin in 2012 and she becomes president and she has access to control where the drones are flown, I have a feeling that places like Austin, Texas, and Berkeley, California, and New York City, and Boston, and Philadelphia might experience um, the presence of drones because uh, President Palin, how does that roll off of your tongue? Uh, I have a feeling that she's going to take the power that Obama amasses and expands beyond what Bush took in terms of war powers to a new level. Scary thoughts. Ooh, I'm going to do this. I have to, I have to go throw up. Excuse me. It's uh you know, it, it it still sounds crazy to a lot of people. Both both President Palin sounds crazy, and the idea of a president, uh, you know, shooting a drone at uh, at a, at a alleged evildoer in the United States and people around uh, are, become collateral damage. Uh, and, and yet, you know, we're we're moving in that direction. Ten years ago, the idea of, of debating whether to use torture would have sounded crazy. The idea of throwing out habeas corpus and locking people up without any due process would have sounded crazy. The, the idea of, of occupying Middle Eastern countries in the way that we're doing uh, with these, these hostile occupations for so long, for longer than any 
previous war, depending on how you measure Vietnam, all of this would have sounded crazy. The, the warrantless spying programs, the, the television cameras at every intersection and on every building, the, the whole surveillance state, all of it would have sounded crazy. So, so, that something, so the idea that something sounds absurd uh, should not be our defense. We ought to have a legal and a political defense as well, and, and the fact that we're removing those protections uh, really should be taken as a serious danger. So I want to get back to this. You say wars are not won. What does that mean? Well, you know, uh, you can't really win a war any more than you can win a hurricane. I mean, I mean a war is a disaster. The, the old conception used to be uh, that you beat the enemy's army down to submission, and then you dictate the terms or negotiate the terms in a peace settlement, uh, and you end the war, and the war is over, and their army goes back home, and our army goes back home, or at least ours does, since the wars are fought on other people's uh, land. Uh, nowadays, without these two armies, with our army going up against uh, a population and a portion of that population that's resisting, uh, it, it's hard to define what victory would look like. Uh, and it, it's hard to imagine what victory in Vietnam would have been, uh, what victory in many of our smaller operations uh, would be. Uh, you know, are we building a nation because our nation building efforts have never once succeeded in building a stable, independent, democratic nation? Uh, are, are we going to fight uh, until we've killed enough people that there's minimal resistance? Um, uh, otherwise, no one's able to define victory. And we've had these endless congressional hearings where we, we bring in people like Richard Holbrook, who's in charge of the so-called civilian effort in Afghanistan, or we bring in General Petraeus, uh, who who's, was in charge of Iraq for a time, now of Afghanistan. Uh, and Congress members ask them, well, what would victory look like? And they can't answer it. They don't have any idea. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they claim they, they, at, at best, the closest they come to a rational explanation for something like the war in Afghanistan is that we have to, we have to stay there to fight Al Qaeda, even though it's not there, and we have to fight the Taliban, which might become friends with Al Qaeda, even though it isn't anymore, uh, and we have to prevent the Taliban from coming into power, uh, even though what we do increases their power and so forth. But there's never any explanation of when that stops, of when those, when those mythical needs to keep fighting that war end, and we brush our hands off and, and head for home. Uh, it, it's just eternal occupation, or we give up and, and end it uh, and say this is enough blood, this is enough treasure, this is enough antagonization of the world. Uh, we're going to take a different approach to things. Um, but this idea of victory, even though nobody knows what it is, is what you see on the bumper stickers and you hear at the rallies and is in the minds of the people who shout USA, USA to shut up uh, the protesters who interrupt the former president and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it's deeply embedded it, to the point where they tell us constantly that we're about to win, we're about to win, uh, we're making progress. Uh, and, and yet nobody can define what that, that final result would be. You know, it's almost like I'm, I'm tempted to say that when the idea of war is brought up, we should demand what will victory look like in this war. And the problem is, though, based on Swanson's rules of war lies, whatever they say is the reason for law, the war is going to be a lie, so any justifications, any predictions of victory based on that lie is going to be a lie too. It's, it's a well, it, it, I, <laughs> it, it is. I, I, I mean, if, you, if you're going to pretend that a nation possessing weapons is the legal grounds for war, and then you're going to pretend that the nation has weapons, and then you're going to pretend that you have forged uh, evidence of, of those weapons, and then you're going to pretend that you, fictional relationships between the nation with the weapons and terrorist groups, you're piling lie upon lie upon lie. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you brush them all away and get, and get down to uh, the pavement, you're left with the fact that legally, uh, you know, only a war that is fighting off an attack on your country it can be legal, uh, and and 
only those wars at best, uh, and arguably not all of those wars, can be moral. Any other war uh, you know, is engaging in the very worst crime imaginable, so that whatever it is you're claiming to be preventing uh, or, 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 or ending by launching your war cannot be pa- possibly be as bad as the war itself. Uh, and so you're, you're engaged in something dishonest to begin with. Any war that you're engaging in other than defending an attack on your country is the very worst crime imaginable? It is. It, it is. It, it, it is mass murder, and there is nothing worse than mass murder, and it brings with it the whole array of, of other crimes that, that we've talked about, the, the abuses of civil liberties def, the defended by war, the, the assassinations and the tortures and the imprisonments that are parts of our wars, the environmental destruction and the rest of it, all come with what was defined at the, the Nuremberg Tribunal after World War II as the supreme international crime, differing from all other crimes in that it encompasses the evil of the whole. That is, it includes within itself uh, every other crime imaginable. Uh, there, there can be nothing worse. Uh, and so uh, the idea of, of using war to, as a humanitarian tool to prevent uh, crimes uh, is at least a very problematic to begin with. Now, your last chapter, maybe your shortest, <laughs> is War is Over if you want it. Yeah, my, you know, my previous book, Daybreak, was largely about activism. I think more than half of it was, well, what do we do to fix the problems I'm talking about? And it was about fixing our broken government. Uh, here I'm looking at one particular uh, issue, albeit the biggest one, the most expensive one, the most uh, damaging one, in, in wars. Um, but, you know, a lot of the same uh, problems and solutions uh, uh, apply. You know, we have to get the money out of the system. We have to get the parties out of complete control of the candidates. We have to create a decent communication system and all the rest of it. Um, but in looking specifically at war, you know, a, a lot of what we have to do is what you and I are doing right now. Uh, talk to people about what wars really are. Uh, if people pictured in their minds what it really means to to launch surgical strikes uh, on uh, on critical targets, you know that that means blowing up apartment buildings and children's uh, limbs and grandmothers being blown to bits and their brains and their stomachs hanging out. You know, if we if we understood what war really is uh, and what. Uh, people do who sell us wars uh, with intentional and very strategic and very manipulative lies, uh, we might have the strength to push back. And, and, and I think that the economic angle, uh, the fact that, that we have more unemployment, long-term unemployment in this country than we've had in, 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 since the Great Depression, uh, and, and that people are starting to make the connection to all the money we're wasting on wars uh, is a big one. I, I don't think we can ever turn away from denouncing the immorality of war and the evil of killing people, which, which believe it or not, motivates millions and millions of Americans to oppose wars. We can't, we can't become complicit in the idea that only selfish interests motivate Americans or anyone else. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, I think there is a powerful opportunity uh, to make that connection and build that movement that says, here's where we want to take all the money away from these foreign crimes that, that, that make us all less safe, and here's where we want to put all that money into jobs and into health care and into green energy and into human welfare. Uh, and if we have a united force that brings foreign and domestic activist groups and organizations together to make that case for shifting our priorities, uh, we really could make the change uh, without which we won't survive. Um, this is Rob Cole, Bottom Up Radio, WNJC 1360 AM, Washington Township. I'm talking with David Swanson, the author of a new top-selling book, War is a Lie. Uh, this is a book that you want to get, whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, you, you need to know the way that our politicians, and it's bipartisan lying. Wouldn't you say that, David? 
Oh, absolutely. No question. I, I mean, the, in July, we had 102 Democrats vote against funding the escalation in Afghanistan and 12 Republicans vote against it. But you had the leadership of both parties uh, absolutely 100 uh, percent on board. Uh, and uh, until you can get the leadership of a party to take a position, it's, it's hard to argue that the party uh, favors that position. Yeah. I mean, we are we are we're moving right now. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we're moving right now into a situation where the Democrats may, uh, in the House, may vote overwhelmingly against funding wars. Uh, is uh, certainly a majority of the Democrats in the House are going to vote against funding wars if current trends. Uh, continue, and I, I, some factors I think suggest that they will, uh, whereas uh, the vast majority of the Republicans will vote to fund these wars, and so they will begin, begin to look like Obama Republican wars or Republico Obama wars. Uh, and, uh, and yet, until we can get a party in power uh, or a combination of members from both parties uh, to form a majority, uh, that will oppose the war. We will just be, uh, you know, making further uphill progress. We, you know, we've gone from from one congresswoman to 114 uh, with steady progress up that hill uh, over these past several years. Who will vote against war funding? I think that will continue, but we have a long ways to go to get to 218. Uh, and, and if the parties didn't control their members so absolutely, and human beings had control over their representatives, uh, we would be far better off and you would see far more Congress members voting against wars uh, from districts uh, that, that are seen as both progressive and conservative. Well, i, I got to tell you, I'm not impressed that the Democrats are now going to vote against the war because they didn't vote against it and they supported it when they had the majority, when they could do something about it. So tell me about this. I mean, what why would they vote against it now? Is it because now they can vote against it and it won't matter? Well, yes. The hypocrisy uh, is, is a huge factor in everything that Congress does. Uh, I mean, we saw in 2009 uh, a bunch of Democrats vote against war funding when it was guaranteed to pass uh, and then immediately turn around and vote for it when the Senate had attached – uh, an unrelated measure that forced all the Republican well, didn't force, but all the Republicans in the House chose to vote no, and the Democrats' votes were needed, then they provided their votes. Uh, so voting no on something that's guaranteed to pass and no one's going to give you much of a hard time over is always easier. Um, even easier is voting uh, yes on a pretty amendment that's attached and, and justifying your anti-war credentials uh, and then turning around and voting yes on the war funding. Uh, and that's been a common theme with, with the Democrats in power. That will go away with the Republicans in power. The Republicans won't be uh, putting doomed amendments that, that express anti-war sentiments on the floor uh, preceding uh, war funding votes. They will just have the war funding votes. Um, they may even uh, you know, put in more war funding than the president wants to differentiate themselves from the president or attach other abusive measures that perhaps the president doesn't want uh, but might not veto a war bill over. Uh, and so you're going to have every reason for Democrats, including the increasing unpopularity of the wars, uh, to vote no. Um, you know, nothing can be predicted with certainty, but I would not be at all surprised if that 114 number went up. If, if you had, I, I mean, we only lost, we only saw three Democrats who voted against war funding lose to Republicans. We didn't see any Republicans who voted against war funding lose. Uh, and, and so, you know, the vast majority, 92 percent of the anti-war caucus in Congress is back, didn't lose. The Democrats who lost were, were pro-war Democrats replaced by pro-war Republicans. Uh, and so the, this slow work that, that may never get anywhere and, and may all be pointless and thus far, of course, has not defunded anything. Uh, but this slow work of building anti-war voters in Congress, uh, I think, will continue uh, a little bit under the radar as always uh, in the coming years. Uh, and if 
if as a result liberals not not anti-war activists but wealthy liberals oblivious to 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 most of what our government does start to identify Barack Obama as the champion of the republicans and the republican wars and and the republicans as the as as the uh as the accomplices of in Obama's wars um i i think that would be a little bit uh undesirable for the president and and if that puts any pressure on the president to reverse his hyper militarized course of action uh, i'd be all for it well you know <clears throat> for those rich wealthy uh liberals met this past week and there was conversation about uh, bringing in some other groups. I'm not sure that the exact uh, talk was about finding somebody to replace Obama, which is my preference, at least at this point in the, his, his history. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're talking about that. Um, you know, he could be replaced, uh, but he has to be—he has to become sufficiently unpopular among Democrats uh, uh, for for other people to think they can challenge him. Well, on op-ed news, I ran a poll, had uh, uh, about 400 people respond, which is not not bad, and uh, over six, it was about 65 percent supporting primarying him. On Daily Kos, it was 26 percent. Now, considering that Daily Kos is such a strong Democratic. Uh, Bastion, the fact that 26% uh, uh, supported primarying him really surprised and pleased me because uh, I really believe that he is unable to grow into the job. I, I have given up on him. Uh, but who knows? You know, it looks like he's getting rid of uh, more and more of his uh, original crop of advisors, and that's good news unless he replaces them with worse people, more bankster, Wall Street friendly people, which unfortunately seems to be what he's doing. I think what David Axelrod, is, the news today is that he's leaving earlier. Uh, he should definitely be gone. That guy is... is, is, is uh. <laughs> but it's but you see we we cheer when anybody leaves you know we cheer when Alberto Gonzalez leaves and then they replace him with somebody worse we cheer when the whole Bush gang leaves and then we find out half of them are staying and then we cheer when Obama people leave you, you know when do we get to cheer for somebody who comes in you know when do we get to cheer for for somebody good coming in with some power to actually do some good well, 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 well. Are, are there some good people in Congress? Are there some really good people in Congress right now? I mean, after, after the, the, the way that the Progressive Caucus collapsed uh, in the face of Obama's health care plan, which today they just diluted further and gave in to McDonald's, by the way, uh, of giving them a pass on some of the rules that went into effect. Uh, yeah. but are there any, are there any, are, are there any anti-war really good legislators right now? Well, I, with full disclosure, I used to work for Congressman Kucinich on one of his presidential campaigns. But he is going to put a—he's going to force a resolution to the floor in January uh, on ending the war in Afghanistan by the following year, uh, and he's going to force a lengthy debate and a vote on that. Uh, and I think that's uh, going to give us a reading of where things stand in the new Congress, and I think that's very helpful. Uh, and I think Congressman Kucinich is one of uh, the best, but there are Congress members who are much better than others. Uh, none of them seem to be perfect. Uh, none of them uh, seem to stand up where you or I would like them all of the time, including uh, Congressman Kucinich, but there are many who are much better uh, than others, and most of the best ones are still there. They're not the ones who lost. Uh, the ones who lost were, were you know, not much worth uh, writing home about. Uh, and the, the question is, can they be brought together into a force with any power? Because as you noted, the Progressive Caucus always caves. It takes nice positions sometimes, but everyone knows that it will cave in when push comes to shove, and it always does. Um, at the moment, Congressman Grijalva, who's been a co-chair, wants to be chair or co-chair again. Um, I say, you know, buddy, you've had your chance. You didn't stand up for anything. Uh, try another angle. Uh, Keith Ellison and Donna Edwards both have put themselves forward as candidates. I think if one of them were to take the position that the Progressive Caucus will have requirements for membership, that you will have to 
be committed to voting against war funding. You will have to commit to certain minimal progressive standards to be in the progressive caucus, even if it's a smaller progressive caucus, uh, and, and if they will commit to building it into a force that raises money and funds its members' reelections when the Democratic Party won't, as it won't. Uh, you know, that person who, who takes that strong position ought to become the new chair of that caucus or another one, but we need uh, we need a caucus. It could be the out of Afghanistan caucus, uh, although Congressman Conyers would be the last person to take a stand on anything. Uh, we need somebody to form an organization within Congress that stands for something that just doesn't uh, put out uh, useful press releases and and rhetoric, but actually stands for something. Uh, that would inspire uh, the people of, of the country uh, to, to to push them. Uh, further and to push their colleagues to join them. And if it were a bipartisan caucus, uh, if it had a handful of, of Republicans committed to it, so much the better, uh, because most Americans are sick of supporting parties and want to support policies uh, and, and principled stands that are actually stands. Well, we wouldn't call it a progressive caucus. What would we call it? The, the Jobs Not Wars Caucus. Okay. Have you heard? You, I'm sure you've heard about the 25% solution. What do you think about that? It's basically a, an idea that 25% of the military budget, uh, official and unofficial, about $250 billion should be taken away and applied for jobs. What do you think about that? I couldn't agree more, uh, and I'm encouraged that this is seeping into the Washington elite in that even the, the two chairmen of the Cat Food Commission, the Deficit Commission, uh, have proposed cutting $100 billion out of the military. Uh, some of it pretty vague and dubious what they're up to, but uh, it includes cutting back foreign bases by a third. You know, That's a good blow to the empire. Um, and, and Jan Schakowsky, who's a member of that commission, is proposing 110 point seven billion dollars uh, in cuts um, and neither of those includes uh, cutting back the wars uh, this is just sort of the base permanent military spending um, I think a lot more than that should be cut I think progressives should be pushing a position that, that demands much bigger cuts than that uh, you know and 25 uh, percent at least is a good start uh, from the base military spending uh, and then compromise from there as needed, let the Congress members do the compromising. Um, but that's you know something that we need to be demanding. And if if this this whole obsession with the deficit can lead to people drawing the connection between war spending and where spending should be happening, uh, so much the better. Uh, then the chances of getting those cuts through a Republican House, uh, uh, you know, still remains a very uphill battle but it's 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 in the discussion uh in a way that it never has been before well you know the idea of big government and spending is something that the tea party uh is interested in maybe that you know i i keep searching for ways that the left and the tea party can find some common ground to squeeze the these duopoly politicians who aren't very different from each other in so many ways uh one may be big military government, and another might be uh, the Patriot Act and how it's uh, stomping on all over our liberties and our constitutional rights. So. Well, I, I I completely agree with the aim, and I, and I think there are ways to do it. It's always dangerous, you know, because you know if if their goal is to is to privatize our harassment in the airports, uh, you know, that could be even worse than the public version. And uh, but there are there are people in the Tea Party, not the sponsors of it, but there are people who, who think of themselves as in it, who want to cut the military and end the wars. I, I think they're a minority even in the Tea Party, um, but they're there and they can be worked with. Um, but there are are dangers because they want to. Somehow, I get this picture in my head of uh, you know instead of having a horse that's harnessed with uh, a plow. Uh -huh. harnessing, sna harnessing snakes, venomous snakes, and working with them. <laughs> Still, right. Maybe, right. Maybe, maybe we'll plant some seeds that will produce some positive changes that we can both benefit from before uh, the snakes bite us or 
it's like, maybe it's we like, can. it's like trying to make yeah. Amazon.com a partner in selling a good book. You know, they they never quite want to be your partner. Um, yeah. I it, when when President Obama came down to Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live, to campaign for Tom Perriello's reelection, which failed. This was just like two days before the election. Uh, I, I went and handed out flyers with all of my friends to the people standing in the endless line all day long to get a chance to see Perriello and Obama, uh, flyers opposing military spending and Perriello's consistent vote for every war dollar ever put before him, uh, and people would, would read the front the, the headline that's, that said, you know, we're, we want jobs, not wars, stop the war spending, and then they would read down a little farther and notice criticism of Tom Perriello, and they would crumple up the piece of paper and angrily throw it at us. So we went a couple blocks away to a park where where the Tea Partiers and the and the right wingers were having their rally, and they've all got signs and shirts and hats that say "cut spending, cut spending, cut spending." So we go, walk up to them and try to talk about cutting the single biggest piece of discretionary spending, uh, and within within a couple minutes, we have people literally screaming in our faces, showing, uh, taking off their jackets to show us their war scars, demanding that we back every war and bigger wars and allow the military to decide for us because it knows best, and if we don't fight them over there, we'll have to fight them over here. And so, and so we didn't quite fit in with either group. Uh, which is a little bit discouraging, and yet within both groups there were exceptions. There were people who wanted to to have friendly conversations who completely agreed with us in both groups, but they were minorities. Yeah, yeah. That's somehow, you know, there's that power law that that twenty percent of the people get eighty percent of the work done. And somehow, <laughs> if we can identify those small groups of people who actually understand what's going on instead of all the people who are using war as injections into their brain to make their penises feel larger, which is uh, what I think a lot of what war is about. Uh, I, you know, it doesn't take a majority to get things done. It takes a, a bunch of hardworking... I mean, I look at what you, as one person, one individual have done. And it's incredible. I mean, and I know a lot of people who know your work, and they look at you and go, and, you know, and think of how, you know, you're, you do what five people do. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and it, Rob, I'm an I'm a online organizer, and you have a bigger, better organized website than I do. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of people doing good work. Um, but I, I, think, I think George W. Bush's book should inspire us because he talks in there about the secret power of the peace movement that people didn't know. You know, the fact that in 2006, uh, when the, the minority Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is denouncing as, tra- as traitors anybody who opposes the war, uh, he's secretly going to George W. Bush and saying, we better get those troops out of Iraq or we're going to get blown away in this election. We better pull them out of there. You, you know, Bush puts this out in his book. And, you know, they never tell you how strong you are. They never tell you how close you're getting. They leave you to believe you're getting absolutely nowhere and you're up against an absolutely impermeable brick wall. Uh, and, and so stories like that, when they come out, suggest the power that the peace movement, of course, in 2006, the peace movement was aligned with forces that that uh, align themselves with the Democratic Party. Uh, and since 2007 and and really since 2009 that hasn't been the case um but if we could find if we could find the groups and the funders and the activists to to rebuild the peace movement now with the republicans in the house I, you know if that if, it, if that's what it takes um i'd be all for it and, and people ought to understand uh, the power, the power not just over public opinion. We know, you and I and everybody else, that we've been winning the public opinion battle, but, but the power to actually get at government officials, which, which people think is, is virtually impossible now. Um, you know, We've been a lot closer than we thought. It's a challenge with uh, Obama acting more like a Republican than a Democrat, and it looks like he's going to move more and more in that direction as the because I, I have a feeling that it although the Senate the Democrats hold the Senate, it's a very weak hold in that the blue dog senators um, 
uh, Nelson and Landrew and Lieberman and Balkus, uh, that crew is going to sell us out and work with the Republicans in a major way. Uh, I don't think Obama has a Congress that he can rely on at all. And so what he's going to do is he's going to act like the shapeshifter he is and the chameleon he is and, and, and become more and more a Republican, unfortunately. Well, that's right. And it, it, uh, and it blows my mind that there are all these Democrats out, Democrats out there who are thinking that you know they have to support him for president. Why? What is he giving us so that that George Bush didn't give us? I mean, <laughs> you know, very, you know, I, very shouldn't, little. I shouldn't say that. There are some small things, you know, but uh, I, I keep saying, you know, and really, you know, that weakens the that, that strengthens the arguments of the moderate Democrats because the moderate Democrats are always saying, well, you Republicans, will, you you you. No, you, you progressives. <laughs> you progressives are never satisfied, uh, no matter what Obama does. But the fact is that the reason I'm opposing Obama is because of what he has done, not because of what he hasn't done. I'm opposing him because of his failure as a leader during the Gulf uh, disaster, and I'm opposing him because of the appointments that he's made um, and his decisions that have led to uh, the job crisis uh, being as bad as it's been. Uh, but you know what? This is going on and on, and I'm digressing. David, it's been great to have you on the show. Uh, <laughs> your, your, your website, warisalive.org, davidswanson.org. Uh, good luck with the book. It, it's, I'm sure it's going to be a great success. I, I really believe it, it, it could be a classic, and I really hope it opens the doors that I've fantasized for you uh, to get some big funding and uh, maybe even a Nobel Prize. Well, I certainly appreciate all of that, Rob, and all of your work and op-ednews.com. It's uh, it's a great, uh, great tool for all of us. All right. Well, thank you.